Good morning. Good morning. Um, it's great to be here to be able to minister God's word to you in this amazing series we're doing, Jesus the Game Changer. Um, for those who did not receive my letter this week, um, most of you did, but if you didn't, you're not on our email uh, list. There is a uh, copy in, in the entranceway. But this Wednesday I go in for some pretty significant surgery. Uh, I'll be out of action probably for two months. Um, so probably you won't see me till mid-October. Um, but for most of this year I have felt fairly unwell. If I get a little bit emotional, just... Um, so we did a whole pile of tests and, you know, my heart is strong. My blood pressure is good for a 65-year-old. My urine is fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Kathy said, oh, you've probably got pre-diabetes with that medicine ball in your stomach. And, uh, and uh, so, um, you know, blood pressure is good. Glucose, all, all that stuff, blood pressure. Um, um, and my, hey, get this, Greek blood, my um, Greek food, my cholesterol is 2.4. So, so I get all these results back, think fantastic. And then they came back and said, but you've got a cancer in your body. And uh, so uh, anyway, uh, so that started the process of, of uh, you know, whole pile of tests. And, and, uh, and so uh, that, was a, that was a difficult period to, uh, to not knowing. And so now they know, they know exactly what they're doing. They want to go in quick, get rid of it. And, um, and then there'll be a you know, four to six week convalescent period. Um, if, for example, um, they, if any cells have escaped and in the lymph system, they will then obviously say, you've got to do secondary treatments and stuff like that. They gave me PET scans and, KET sc and said, there's no secondary cancers from my brain to my toe. There's nothing there, which is great. So the, the medical specialists are really uh, very positive. Um, but there's obviously risks and stuff like that, so I'd appreciate your prayers. In fact, uh, right now, right across the world, there are tens of thousands of people praying. One church in South Africa has about 75,000 members, uh, Bishop Moses Sono, so, so they've said, we're praying for you today, and, and right across uh, um, the CRC uh, denomination that, that I'm uh, privileged to lead and, uh, and other places. So, um, yeah, so uh, appreciate your prayers. And uh, uh, I'm looking to God for a good, good result. I, I, f I feel amazing peace. I really have. Uh, Philip, Pastor Phil's uh, word to me just beforehand. I just feel His presence. I feel peaceful. Um, I said to the specialist, you know, come on, doc, let's get this done. Three weeks ago, he just laughed at me and said, uh, No, 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 we've got to wait. And uh, so they, uh, you know, because they gave me some pretty intrusive uh, biopsies that, you know, the organs needed to heal and all that stuff. So, um, uh, but anyway, I'm in good hands. I'll be out of action, uh, but I'm coming back and um, uh, probably by mid-October, if I have to undergo further therapies, then it'll probably be, they say, another five or six, up to six months or so. So I may be out of action till uh, um, Easter next year, to the end of February, March. But um, I am so thrilled with our teams here. Um, I have made sure in the recent weeks that our house is in order. My family, my personal family, and my church and Christian Family Centre Church of Seton and all the churches we've started, and also our CRC movement. And, uh, and I'm delighted uh, that our team are, are fabulous in how they're operating. And as in my letter, I've mentioned to you that Pastor Tim Lockins um, is our... Uh, Deputy Senior Minister of Christian Family Centre Churches. Though he started CFC South, um, he's part of our Board of Elders and he is the Vice Chairman of the Board of Elders. He'll be leading the board and uh, also um, once a month he'll be coming here to minister at all services. We're trying to Friday as well as Sunday and he'll be supporting uh, our senior leadership team, um, which is, you know, Pastors Cass Tompich, Nathan Betcher um, and... Um, Sam Chesser and Milan Tompich as our general manager, so he'll be there to assist and help. So uh, CFC is in good hands, fantastic leaders, and um, 
and same as with uh, our CRC movement. I can't go to the national conference, first one I've missed in 17 years. Um, but Pastor Bruce Sharman, who is our national vice chairman, uh, we got together last Monday and, and so he's taking charge and he's a fantastic man of God and, um, and so uh, we, we're uh, looking to him for um, God to provide for us. So I appreciate your prayers. I think we're going to pray at the end of the service, huh? I felt to share the word, or in fact, my wife said to me, you, you should preach the final Sunday before you go in. And uh, so that's her fault. Because no. <laughs> I'm supposed to be in Europe. I'm supposed to be in Africa, Europe, five weeks away. And, you know, with uh, my, my trips to Ghana and ministry there, and then to Canada for the World Pentecostal Conference representing the CRC. Uh, so they, they had to be cancelled. But um, so I felt... In the series, the Jesus the Game Changer, I'd like to share about leadership because that's one of the topics that Carl Fays has put together. And this series is fantastic. If you're not part of our life groups, you should be because the DVDs of Carl sharing with all these experts of how Jesus has changed the game forever in our world. Um, and particularly when it comes to leadership, the world before Jesus... Um, the world that Jesus came into is what we call the Greco-Roman world. Basically, Greek culture, Roman power, okay? Uh, the Greeks were the brains, the Romans were the brawn. Um, and so our understanding of leadership um, was, was totally the opposite to what we have now. For example, the two most influential people in the Greek-Roman world for hundreds and hundreds of years uh, were Alexander and Caesar. Can we see a picture of Alexander, what he looked like? That's Caesar, that's big Julie, and that's Alex. Um, so uh, Alexander the Great was, uh, both of them were geniuses, no doubt about it. Um, I've got a book home, uh, the latest biography on Caesar called The Life of a Colossus, about this thick. I read it through and I thought, man, what an amazing human being. Um, Alexander was 32 when he died and he um, conquered the world, basically, from 18 years of age to 32, 13 years. And he never lost a battle. Um, he went from uh, Greece all the way through to India. And he wanted to take the whole of India and then to go to China. But the Macedonian soldiers, the 50,000 men that went with him said, Alex, that's enough. We want to go home. And they, uh, so he realised he had to go back. Then he um, went to Babylon where he had uh, had his palace uh, knocked off the... And he died, died of malaria. And uh, amazing human being, but totally flawed. Uh, one time, just to give you an example, he's an emperor, he's a, he's a king. All executive, legislative, judicial power is in him. His best friend is a guy called Clytus. Uh, Clytus saves him at the battle of, I think, Gargamala or Issus, I'm not too sure. And so Alexander was one of the few kings that actually was up the front. He didn't lead from the back. He actually was a warrior king. He was up the front, and so his soldiers, his bodyguards went crazy. They're saying, let's just get around him. And so uh, one time he climbed a wall in India as they're throwing spears and he actually, and the men were too scared, he actually jumped down. And they all go, what the heck? And they all jumped down too. So he's he a ferocious uh, uh, man. Um, but this guy, Clytus, saved his life in one of the battles. And then Alexander, in one of his drunken stupors, he's just raving and talking and bragging and Clytus says, you know, isn't it about time you grew up, Alex? And, and said to him, some of the things you're doing are wrong. Now, they grew up as friends. Alexander grabs a spear, kills him instantly. Just slaughtered him. All his men freaked out. No arrest, no judicial. He can't. He's, he's the emperor king. Alexander was so bizarre that he tried to kill himself then and there. He said, I've killed my best friend. He tried to destroy himself and they held him back. So a very flawed man, died at 32 years of age in Babylon, probably of malaria or yellow fever. But he was the role model of what leadership was about. 
okay? And get this, leadership had nothing to do with morality or ethics. It had to do with power, position, prestige, palaces, <laughs> and gaining your will over people. The second man, Julius Caesar, it was murdered in the Ides of March, 44 BC, the most famous assassination in history. And uh, um, amazing man, actually, amazing. If you want to understand politics, Caesar created the modern form of politics, basically. He was a master politician. And at, uh, at 40, I think he was 40 years of age, he's in Spain doing something as a politician in Rome, and he sees a statue of, of Alexander, and he falls on his face and weeps and says, I've achieved nothing. He says, oh, Alexander achieved so much more. So then he decided that the only way that he could end up becoming the ruler of, of Rome was if he had a military command. So he, he got himself into debt, got a military command, and then he went and conquered Western Europe. Conquered France, Germany, Spain, Latinized the whole of Western Europe. A million people died in the process. Um, and uh, then he came back and, and uh, amazing man, but you know, on his way to power, just to show you the corruption uh, in Rome, the way that he actually gained power over the Senate was that he, he targeted the major leaders of the Senate and he seduced their wives. So he thought if I can get them in bed and then tell the world about it, those men will realise I have more power than them. Terrible, really. So he, he, he basically did this. And um, no wonder he was hated by a lot of people, in spite of his brilliance. And um, so he personified that leadership has to do with power over people. Okay, um, It had to do with manipulation, control. You could do what you wanted. The only way you could get rid of those leaders is to actually kill them. It's the only way. The only way that the constitution, there was no constitutional way by which, so the world was, for example, words like mercy, humility, were, were swear words. If you, in the Greek Roman world, it, it was a, a, a terrible environment. Uh, women were treated like, like dirt. Children had no rights. Um, so uh, in the Greek world, uh, for example, you married, and basically not out of love, but just to produce kids. And then uh, in, in the Greek world, and a little bit in the Roman world, is the highest form of love was that a, a grown man would have a little boy. And that was a relationship that he would develop. So Alexander had his boy. Achilles, the great hero that destroyed Troy, he had his little boy. And so uh, this homoerotic kind of love was supposedly the highest form of love. Not So it was wacky. It was weird. And I'm a Greek man, and I'm, it's awful even talking about the great Greeks, but yet the morality, the ethics were just terrible. It was a brutal world. Little girls. If you had a little girl, they weren't worth much. So, so there was in, in, infanticide. So they would leave the babies on the side of a hill. Most cities would have a hill and the babies would just die or the animals would eat them, because you wanted to have boys. Um, and so, and we're talking about a, a world that was full of power, but it was totally morally, ethically shot to pieces. Jesus comes into this world. And, uh, and you know what he did? He conquered Alexander and Julius Caesar within 300 years. His ideas, his influence, change the trajectory of the entire world when it comes to leadership, totally. How did he do it? How did Jesus do it? He only lived for 33 years till his crucifixion and then he went back to heaven. He only ministered for three years. How did he conquer this terrible culture that was, had, had such a, a perverted view of how people exercise influence over each other. Well, firstly, through his revolutionary teaching about servanthood. In, in Mark chapter 10, it's an amazing story. So here is Jesus with his 12, 
And if you know the chronology of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, um, he only started talking about his impending death on a cross about nine months before the Passover, the third or fourth Passover that he was going to go to in Jerusalem where he knew he was going to die for the sins of the world because they, they wouldn't have been able to understand. So he shares with them. He's talking to them about, boys, the reason I've come here is to show you what God is like. I am God. He said he was God. He and the Father were one. Before Abraham, he was. I've come to show you God has appeared in human form. I'm fully man, but I'm fully God. And you see how I'm acting. He goes, but really my ultimate purpose is to die. And they just said, what are you talking about? They're thinking, no, you've come to destroy Caesar. You've come to overturn that Greek-Roman world by power. Throw the bums out, the colonialists, and, and we, we're going to get free. Israel's going to be politically free. They saw it in political terms, in military terms. The culture of the world had infected even them. And so he's, trying, he's talking to them about a, a, a cross that he's got to bear for the sins of the world. And James and John, in, in, in Mark's account, in one of the other accounts, it says they got, he got, they got their mum to do this. You know what they did? They said they took Jesus aside. They said, Jesus, listen, we've got a plan. When you get, when the kingdom's set up, could you put Johnny on one side and Jimmy on the other side, closest to you? One throne for them and one throne for me. Or the mother said, for my boys. And Jesus must have just gone, ay, ay, ay. Don't they get it? He's talking about a cross that he has to bear to be able to remove sin, the barrier between a perfect God and imperfect human beings, and they're focused on a crown, a human crown. They were so infected by the water of the Greek Roman culture that it was going to sink their lives. They had no understanding of what he was really saying. And so then he takes them aside and he rebukes them beautifully. I mean, Jesus is so good. I would have said, boys, you're out of the team. You're sacked. I'm going to get two new ones. Not Jesus. He somehow lovingly teaches them. And this is what he said. He called them together, the 12. Because when Peter and the others found out what Jimmy and Johnny were up to, they were mad. They were like, what the heck? You turncoats? You want a special place? They probably said, we want that special place. So division. So that, that beautiful ministry team for two and a half years was about to be divided by this action of James and John and their mum. And he called them together and he said this, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And their high officials exercise authority over them. And these are the four words that should be printed in every leader's manual. Not so with you. Do you want to say it with me? Not so with you. He says, this, this is the antithesis of my kingdom. Earthly kingdoms operate on a totally different premise. But Alexander is dead. Julius Caesar is dead. The Roman Empire, the Greek Empire, the Persian Empire, the Babylonian Empire, the Assyrian Empire, the Hittite Empire, the Egyptian Empire have all crumbled and gone. But Jesus' empire, his kingdom is living on because the values that underpin it are eternal. Whereas the values of Alexander and Julius Caesar, as brilliant as they, as they were, are temporal. They cannot last when it's built on anything outside. And so Jesus transforms this and he says, not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must what? Be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must what? Be slave of all. And look at this. For even the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve. Wow. And to give his life as a ransom for many. I am so thrilled with the Christian Family Centre and our CRC movement, the denomination that we are part of. I'll tell you why. Because I've seen churches come and go. In fact, I've seen some Pentecostal denominations come and go. 
And the reason why they go is their fundamental understanding of leadership is skewed. They think of position, power, palaces, prestige over people. They haven't actually embraced that it's about servanthood. Can I say, I'm away for two months, maybe six months. The church ain't going to miss a beat here, the Seton Church. CFC Church is not going to miss a beat. CRC movement, why? Because it's not built around one man and, and his particular gifts or a group of men and women. It's built around Jesus Christ and the values that he has given to us. And the first and great value is this of servanthood. Of servant. You know, years ago, maybe 17, how long have I been leading the CRC? 17 years. Years ago, we heard of a denomination that when they have their national conference, the leaders, the leader and his team, never eat with the plebs. Hey, they have another room. So in the tent here and there, they, they eat on their own. They have, and when I found out about that and others, I was like, wow, that's terrible. So we made a ruling. You know, we said, when we come together as a national leadership team, we will eat with the people, with the leaders and the pastors. And how often have I asked my assistant, whoever that is, I say, just, just get that church. I might pick a church that might be, let's say, um, Orange, New South Wales, or, or some other place, a little church with a pastor, I say, just tell them I'd like to have a meal with them and their team. Well, they nearly die with their leg in the air. Because they don't know me as such. They know me as a leader. But when to, to actually go down, to lower myself in their minds, to actually go and eat with them, you've got to believe the effect it has on them. But to me, it's no big deal. It's just what we do. This is, we're here to serve the best interests of people. It's not about us. And I know that our senior leadership team here, and Pastor Cass, Pastor Nathan, Pastor Sam, they oversee our three services, and Milan Tompic, our, our general manager, they are servant leaders. And, and the church is in safe hands. Pastor Tim is a servant leader. And Jesus says here, you cannot deviate from this. And uh, if we deviate from it, then what we're going to do is and embrace human the ethic of Alexander and Julius, no, we don't want that. Servanthood. Secondly, how does Jesus conquer? How did he conquer them? Through his revolutionary teaching, servanthood. Through his transformative example, selflessness. These are great scriptures. So just before he dies, so the first scripture, Mark 10, is, is like nine months before he dies, and he's trying to explain to them about the cross and there's talking about a crown and he introduces servanthood. Now, the night before he dies, he drives home that how servanthood manifests itself is by acts of selflessness. Acts of selflessness. And so they're at the Last Supper. And you know what Jesus does? He decides to wash their feet. Now, if you decided to wash my feet, let's say, uh, who's a good, uh, Andrew, uh, and, and who, who's one of these boys, who would like to wash my feet? Anyone here? <laughs> uh, your kids like to wash my feet? Ah, oh, James, you would, wouldn't you? I tell you, you take these shoes off and you take these socks and you can put your nose by my feet, they smell nice. I've washed them, <laughs> I've washed them and perfumed them just for you. It's no big deal. In Jesus' day, it was a really big deal. You know why? Because they walked the streets. They didn't have these shoes. They had thongs. They had leather sandals. And you know, where you walk the streets, the sanitation ain't existing like we have today. Waste. Animals are everywhere. You know what animals do when they're everywhere. So you, as you're walking, you, your feet are pretty bad. So when you go into someone's house... Oh, it's not good. So the servant, the lowest person in the hierarchy of that household was the person designated to wash the feet. And I mean, it really was. They used to have special pegs they put on people's noses. No, I'm just teasing you. But he would just wash their, they'd wash their feet. And Jesus says, no one's washed feet. And, and he actually washes their feet. Peter. 
course, Peter, he said, no, you're not washing my feet. You can't, well, you're, you're God, you know, like, you can't do that. And Jesus just says, well, Pete, he goes, if I can't wash your feet, you can't be part of my kingdom. And then he starts stripping off. Wash everything then, Jesus, you know, like. <laughs> and I'm sure the Lord said, no, no, put your clothes on. Just, 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 just your feet will be enough, thank you. <laughs> and he says this, you call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so. Teacher, Lord, God. For that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I, I've set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Do you know what ministry is? And I want to put this image in your heads, all of you. Do you know what, to define ministry, how, how do you serve? You know what, what, what ministry is? You grab a bowl and you grab a towel and you go around washing people's feet. That's what it's about. That's what it's about. That's the highest calling that a human being can have. Jesus is saying, you don't just bow to those that are greater than you, because you bow to those that are in a lower state than you. The poor, the needy, the destitute, the suffering. We're there to give of our lives. You know, since uh, I shared Thursday when I sent my letter out all over the place, I've received so many letters back in response. And one letter that came back, I forgot all about this. In the early days, uh, one of our women in the church here developed uh, Gillian Barr syndrome, which is what Pastor Bruce Hamble had. And Gillian Barr syndrome will kill you if you don't get, get straight to a hospital. And uh, you've got to go straight in. And they, um, So she had Gillian Barr. They just discovered it straight to hospital. I forgot that Kathy invited all the kids, she's got lots of kids, and her husband to come and park in our house for the two or three weeks, whatever it was, until they could just get all the blood out and new blood in. And, and, uh, and he wrote and said, you know, we remember your kindness to us back then. I forgot about that. So I was like, well, it wasn't me, it was my wife. And, uh, and, and they just said, can we, is there anything we can do to give back to you? I thought, oh, wow. And that's like 35 years ago. And I'm thinking, an act of selflessness that you undertake can so be transformative in a person's life that they'll remember it 40 years later. An act of selfishness, also they'll remember, but in the negative. And Jesus is saying, this is what ministry is about. It's actually giving of yourself to others. And, and the... The foundation of servanthood is selflessness, not selfishness. And we all struggle with this because our sin nature is one that we want to promote ourselves and we want to, what are we going to gain from it? But the Jesus way is not what we're going to gain from it. It's how can, how can I add value to another person's life where they will gain? The virtues of humility and mercy were foreign to the Greek Roman world. Jesus, through his followers, conquered the Greek Roman world by these acts of kindness and selflessness. When the Emperor Constantine in 312 AD, someone will find out that I'm wrong on that one, either 312 or 315, um, at the Milvian Bridge outside Rome when he was about to be killed by another army. And so they're fighting who's going to... Most of the emperors actually were warlords. Most of the emperors in, in Rome were champion soldiers because the people wanted the brute force. And you know, he had a vision. And um, whether it was correct or not correct, he felt Jesus say to him, you're going to be the next emperor, and in this sign, the sign of the cross, you conquer. He won that battle, became emperor, and legalised Christianity. He said it's the most influential. It affected his mum. It affected... And, but the, they reckon the numbers of Christians are only about 10% of the Roman Empire. If the Roman Empire had maybe 75 million people, we're talking about 7.5 million people. But they had so influenced, they had so salted the corrupting flesh of this Roman Empire, they were the ones that cared for the orphans. They were the ones that built the hospitals. They were the ones that took the children off the, off the, the sides of slopes and, and brought them into their homes. 
They were the ones that stopped the Colosseum being used to kill people, to, to stop gladiatorial things. Even the fact that the, when they stop, the killing of the babies didn't stop for, for, for a couple of hundred years. But you know that the Christian families, the men and the women married for love and they stayed faithful to each other. Roman men were just, like I said, followed Julius Caesar's example. So romance, love, relationships had nothing to do with it. And there were some exceptions to it. And so what happened in Christian families is, is the families were big and they didn't kill their girls. So if you had 10 kids and five were girls and five were boys and people looking in could see that husband loves his wife. He stays, he doesn't visit the brothel. He's not doing this. And it became a credible witness. There was a scarcity of women. There were too many men in the Roman Empire. So the men had to find women to marry. Who were the best women in town? The Christian girls. So when they come with suiting, the dads were sitting down saying, well, you ain't getting her unless you give your life to Jesus, repent of your sins, and then we want to see whether in fact you practice it. And this is true. Hundreds of thousands of men married Christian women and the basis of them being allowed to marry them, they had to turn their lives over to Christ. Powerful. Just marriage and family became a very powerful social network to infiltrate the Roman Empire. 10%. But they so, were so pervasive, even the Emperor Constantine said, well, I think they've won. Let's legalise it. Now, whether he was a true believer, we don't know. Because in the process of him being a Christian emperor, he had his wife killed. He had two sons, I think one son executed. He did some pretty bad things. So he was a politician and a Christian. So just because you're a Christian doesn't mean you'll be a good politician. <laughs> so we don't know with Constantine. And he waited to get baptised in water until the very end, a few days before he died. So selflessness, the virtues of humility, mercy, selflessness, serving, became foundational to what leadership is today. So let me say this to you. Let me give you names to show you how... And if, if this was a non-Christian audience, they'd say the same thing. We detest pride. We hate arrogance. We hate conceit. We love humility. We love mercy. We love... The, the, this is like... So let me give you these names. Give me a thumbs up if they're good. Give me a thumbs down if they're not so good. Adolf Hitler. Two. <laughs> Nelson Mandela. Joseph Stalin. Martin Luther King Jr. Donald Trump. No, 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 don't, 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 don't. <laughs> Scott Morrison. <laughs> I'm being naughty now. Come on. <laughs> Don't bring politics into church. And uh, so you see, we, we hate pride, arrogance, conceit, but we love the humble. Now you might think, Martin Luther King Jr., Nelson Mandela, they were strong men. Strong men. You wouldn't mess with them. You read Mandela's story. You read Martin Luther King's story. They were strong men. They were men, men. They were masculine men. Good masculinity, okay? Not toxic stuff. I mean, they were good. And, and only the strong, only those that have a good sense of self-worth and self-esteem can really understand humility. Because if you don't have a, long, a strong sense of self-esteem and, and a confidence in who you are, you will interpret this as being, I'm going to lower myself. I, I, th I think bad of myself. I'm going to... It's not... Meekness is not weakness. Jesus said in Matthew 11, he goes, for I am what? Humble and gentle. Meek, humility. The Greek words praudes and tapinophrosi are two of the most magnificent Greek words. You check it out. Praudes, tapinophrosi. Jesus said, I am humble. I'm meek and gentle. But he's the toughest man that ever lived. You wouldn't mess with Jesus. 
You wouldn't mess with Martin Luther King Jr. You wouldn't mess with Nelson Mandela. He had, they were strong men who had all their power under control to serve the best interests of other people. That's the difference. It's not thinking, more, thinking bad of yourself. It's, it's lowering yourself, okay, not to win kudos with those that are higher than you, but to gain, to help somebody who's in need. This is the ethic of Jesus. The final thing, how did he conquer this Greek-Roman world and change the concept of, of leadership? Through his revolutionary teaching, servanthood, through his transformative example, selflessness, and through his saving death, sacrifice. Remember in Mark 10, he said, the final verse, verse 45, for the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The Apostle Paul says to the Philippian church, now, Philippi was named after Alexander's father, King Philip of Macedon. And uh, it was a Roman colony. The Romans had actually taken it over and ex-soldiers were given grants of land. So it's a pretty important city, Philip. I've been there. And uh, it was also one, it was the great battle area also where, uh, where Julius Caesar uh, and, uh, and Mark, Ant Ma sorry, Mark Antony's forces destroyed the people that killed Julius Caesar. It's huge battlegrounds in Philippi. And, um, and so this city was filled with Rome ex-soldiers, land, had land grants, as well as the, the Greek population that was there. And... Uh, Amazingly, it's, it's the one area where Paul doesn't seem to be saying to the church, you guys have got massive problems. They had a few problems, and he addresses it in Philippi, but not, nothing like the Corinthians and others. So this place that had seen a lot of hardship, a lot of suffering, a lot of battles, a lot of difficulties, a lot of slaughter, and men who had seen war and now were... were, who, who were Landowners and now we're coming into the church. And he says this to them. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ. Just put the scripture up, guys. Philippians 2. Any encouragement from being united with Christ. Oh, I tell you. I've had lots of encouragement from Jesus over the past four weeks. If any comfort from his love. Ah, oh, the love of his love working through people has bowled me over, and Kathy, and my kids. If any common sharing in the Spirit, oh, the Holy Spirit's been my friend. If any tenderness and compassion, look at the words. Paul said, make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one and of one mind. Yes. This is what I'll say to you as the 1030 congregation. If I can say anything to you, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Become a sacrificial, selfless servant leader. Pick up the bowl and the, and the towel and serve people, serve humanity. Serve within the church, serve within your community. It's not about money, it's not about position, it's not about promotion. The thing that's going to last forever and ever is what you do in Christ's name to the least of these. To help and to add value and to bless and I tell you, if we do that as a church, there's no, there's no ending to our influence in, in the decades ahead. He says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Wow. Rather in humility, value others above yourselves. Can you imagine how revolutionary this was to Romans, Roman soldiers? Pompey's troops and Caesar's troops and Antony's troops and Octavian's troops that were owning the land of Philippi. This is countercultural. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, church, have the same mindset as Jesus. And this is Jesus. Who being, this is the great statement of Paul, probably one of the greatest statements ever written, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used 
to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. Which actually, that's a terrible word, nothing. It's actually, he, he, the Greek word is he condescended. He, he left that lofty place and identified with us. Not that we're nothing, but compared to heaven where he was, the eternal son who was in perfect fellowship with the Father and the Holy Spirit, the price that God had paid that forever, forever, he would look like a 33-year-old Palestinian Jew whose body has been massacred. And when you see him, you'll see, heck, that's a terrible wound. That's a terrible wound. If he takes off his clothes, you'll see his back is massacred. You'll see his head. It's not going to be a pretty picture when we see Jesus face to face. But it's going to remind us the price that God had paid. Sacrifice to save us. To be able to cancel out our sins, our debts that we, that we were accruing because of our our, our many sins that caused offence to God the Father. The only way those sins could be expiated, dealt with, was by him dying on a cross and shedding his blood to cover the sins of, of, the, of humanity. And this is what he says here. He says he became a human being. Taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, the plan of the Father to save you, even death on a cross. That's why God exalted him. And that's why if you, if you practice sacrificial, selfless servanthood, God will exalt you in his good time. And it's a proper exaltation. It's not based on ego. It's, it's based on, you know what, I'm just so, like all the letters I've received, I'm just thinking, wow, are they talking about me and Kathy? No, because you just kind of think, well, that's just what you do. And I thought, I've just been exalted. I've just been, oh, wow, I've been encouraged so deeply in the last couple of days. It's been amazing. And, and the thing with Jesus, you know what's amazing about this passage he wasn't embarrassed. God wasn't embarrassed to die where common criminals are killed. If you're a Roman citizen, death was instantaneous. Beheading, instant death, no, no pain, nothing. Crucifixion it could take three to five days where you're asphyxiated. Stark naked. Forget the loincloth stuff you see in the movies. Naked before all those women. His mum and the women, beaten, abused, spat upon. And at the end, the Romans said, ah, oh, this has taken too long to kill him. And then they just break their bones here, just smash the, the bones so they can't lift themselves up to breathe. It's a terrible death. It's a shocker. Death on a cross. And the thing is, God didn't disguise himself. Jesus didn't disguise who God is when he walked this earth. He revealed what he was like fully. And he didn't disguise what God was like on a cross. Because only through the cross can we see the full manifestation of the nature of God. Even Jesus' words as he walked this earth, recorded in the Gospels, even his actions, you're reading, they're written by men, inspired by the Holy Spirit, to try and give us a glimpse of God walking. It's imperfect. You know what's the perfect vision of what God is like? It's when you look at a cross. When you see God hanging there. God who could have snapped his fingers like this and had 80,000 angels wipe out the Roman Empire. You see God hanging there not because of nails, but because of love. The love held him there. It wasn't the nails. People think the Romans killed him. They didn't kill him. He, he chose to die. That's why they were so, the centurion got saved when, when, when Jesus said, you know, when he uttered those words. And then at the end, he says, Father, into your hand. He said, I forgive them. Even, even these murderers, I forgive them. I find something good in them. Ignorance. I don't know what they're doing. Father, forgive them. I don't know what they're doing. Same as us. He forgives us. We don't know what we're doing. 
We're crazy. We're insane. We're sinful. I can't condemn the world for all the terrible sins they do. Why? Because but for the grace of God, there I go. I. So, so he says, I, I, I want to forgive them all. I forgive them. I want them to come to faith. The centurion freaked out because then he says, Father, into your hands I'll give you my spirit. And it just goes, whoop. He goes, hey, people don't die like that. So he chose to give up his spirit. He could have lived three or four days. He says, no one can kill me because I give my life and I'm going to take it up again. He's the eternal son of God. Now the Romans were used and the Jewish authorities on a human level, but God in his sovereignty worked it through so that the son of God willingly laid down his life for you and me. God hanging there between heaven and earth. And somehow, mysteriously, God the Father is able to forgive us and cancel out our sin, give us eternal life, live forever, heaven's our home, peace here on earth, a future hope, all because of what Jesus did. And I can't understand that outside of... So it is through the cross that we see the prism of God's light fractured into this beautiful rainbow of love. Amazing. Amazing. Technicolor view. We see, we see a loving God. We see a forgiving God. We see a merciful God. We see a reconciling God. We see a restoring God. We see a good God. We see a heavenly dad who weeps with us. He's not somebody who's angry with us. He's only angry at sin and the devil and sickness and, and, and death and all that stuff. That's why in heaven there'll be none of that stuff. It's all going to be removed. It's all part of the curse. Sin, sickness, death, disease, war is all of the devil. It sort of annoys me a little bit when I have a, the surrealness of I feel good and I think, man, I've got this rotten devil cancer in my body. It shouldn't be there. And the medical profession say it shouldn't be there either. Let's get rid of it in Jesus' name, eh? And, and so, so why? Because we want, God wants to bring healing and health and to alleviate suffering in our world. Why do we have psychological services, healing disciplines, supporting the poor, the needy? Because he wants to push back evil. And one day, all that's going to be removed. And it only can be removed because Jesus on a cross died. And there we see what God is really like. And God didn't disguise himself. He fully revealed himself through the cross. You can't be a Christian unless you've embraced the cross life. You can't, be a, you can't understand this unless you just say, Lord, I just accept it. I accept it. Save me. Heal my soul. I can't do anything about it. I just, I'm just full of gratitude to your amazing grace. And that transforms our life. That transformed my life as a 17-year-old boy. And it's never left me. In 48 years. It's as fresh today as it was back then. It changes everything. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the opportunity to minister your word about how Jesus has changed the game, many games in this world, and particularly this game of leadership, where people are still playing funny games with leadership and causing so much havoc in our world. We see what Jesus has done in transforming our understanding of leadership by his teaching, by his example, by his death. That it's all about servanthood that's rooted in selflessness and that is sacrificial in its very nature. Father, as we conclude this morning by taking the great symbol of true selfless sacrificial servanthood that speaks to us of a cross that split history in two and changed our BCs to ADs. Lord, help us to appropriate what you've done for us on a cross 2,000 years ago. Loving Father, in Jesus' name, Speak to every heart. For any who don't know you as their saviour, may they give their lives to Christ today. Holy Spirit, move upon our hearts. In Jesus' name. I'm going to ask the ushers to bring...
communion to us, the emblems of bread and wine. This is the Lord's table. It's not the Christian Family Centre's table. It's open to anyone and everyone. If you're a visitor here, if you haven't given your life to Christ, but everything within you is saying, Bill, I, I would like to give my life to Jesus, or I want to draw close to him. Take these emblems. They're physical emblems that speak of an invisible spiritual grace that God has accomplished for us through his cross. So I invite you to take these emblems and we're going to eat and drink together. Thank you, ushers. Wait on us now. There's no reason why the Christian Family Centre and all our churches and all our entire CRC movement could be around for hundreds of years if Jesus doesn't come, if we don't deviate from this basic truth on leadership. About servanthood, selflessness, sacrifice, it's taking up a bowl and towel, serving the best interests of others. It's not thinking bad of yourself, it's lowering yourself. Not to those that are greater than you, but to those who are in need. Add value to their lives, to help them, to bless them. This is the only way our world will be transformed. When they see how much Christ followers love each other and how that love overflows to their community, to the people in need around about them. To be known as the greatest lovers in all the world, the greatest givers in all the world, the greatest servants in all the world, where their acts of selflessness and kindness and courtesy and consideration will transform people's hearts and minds. where genuine sacrifice can be seen because we've seen it on a cross 2,000 years ago and it melted our hearts. And we can't do it, church, without Jesus' presence. These emblems speak of his death on a cross, but we cannot understand fully the cross unless we have the Holy Spirit and the resurrected Christ sent the Holy Spirit and it's like Jesus coming to us, not just being with us, but living in us. Because the Holy Spirit and Jesus have the same nature. That's why Paul says it's Christ living in you, or it's the Holy Spirit living in you. You can't do this without the risen Christ living in you and you letting Him minister through you, through the presence and power of the Holy Spirit being able to rise above our natural limitations, our finite resources, as we look to Him to work mightily, powerfully in and through us for the salvation of our world. Father, as we stand in Your presence holding these emblems, we see a cross before us. We see the broken body and the shed blood of Your Son being poured out so our world could be saved. Father, we see your heart of love. Father, we see your attitude that you so want to forgive the sins of all people. You want to save everyone. You don't want to condemn them. You're merciful to the lost. You want to reconcile us to yourself and to one another. You want to restore our bodies and our hearts and our minds and our memories. The cross reveals your goodness like nothing else. How good you are, how good you have been to us and how good we know you will be to us in the coming days. Father, we thank you for this rich and free yet so costly a grace that's been revealed at the cross through Jesus sacrificing his life in the ultimate act of selflessness and servanthood. We're so grateful, we're so thankful. Help us to be the people that you want us to be, both now and in the coming days. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's eat and drink together.